Hello, everybody, and welcome to, uh, I still don't remember because I didn't make myself a note. Um, this is Unit 3. This is the last lecture in Unit 3. This is uh, Death and Dying. So, as I mentioned earlier, Death and Dying is a challenging event for everybody. We live in a culture and our, uh, that avoids discussing death and dying and our profession is you know our school of discipline if you will is um one that seeks to avoid it at all costs that death is the enemy that that's what we're arguing and we're, we're fighting against death and disease states so hospice itself is challenging when we are acknowledging that we are out of options and our best option at this point is to allow a comfortable death um, as much as possible. This is really, uh, again, if you haven't seen this or experienced this, it's hard to describe. It is an uncomfortable situation. It's just not something that people are prepared for. It's challenging for the patient, for the family, and for the care team. Uh, few people are trained well in this to help people die a comfortable death, to die well. Um, I don't really like that phrase. Die well sounds like a if you'll pardon my nerdiness here. Die well sounds like something that like a Viking or Klingon would say, like die well in battle. But a comfortable, easy death is what we're after. And that is not to say that this is a training module that is going to help you with that. It's not. I am not any better at this than anybody else. Uh, this is not to give you steps in what to do necessarily. What this is is a description, a kind of an overview of what, what to expect and what your uh, what expectations for you will be as somebody enters uh, end of life stages. So uh, we are we are discussing in a natural death here. We're not talking about somebody who got like hit by a bus. This is a long term. This is a death from a long term progression, whether it's old age or it is a long term disease. But there are, in that situation, there are definitive steps. Uh, most of the time in medical settings, you will hear people refer to the preactive and the active stages of dying. Sometimes it's broken into early, middle, and late. And kind of as you'd expect if you're dividing three into two, all of early and some of mid go into preactive, and all of late and some of mid go into active. We're going to be referring to preactive and active. Again, within most settings, you're going to be you're going to hear people refer to a patient being in preactive or actively dying, uh, which I have always thought sounds a bit strange, but I don't know what else you'd call it. Your role as the uh, dietitian changes during the phases and the dying process as a whole. You probably already noted that that in hospice. When we have accepted the fact, or when everybody, I don't say it's we, it's not like it's our decision. When the decision has been made, there we go, that death is inevitable acute soon, that your, your responsibilities change. And that happens more so in end of life. So that's what we are discussing here. Again, terminal condition. Um, I've already given you this definition a few times. I, I'm sure you don't need it again. There are no obviously disi distinct signs and symptoms to a terminal condition. Uh, it very much depends on what you, what the patient has, what you're working with. Um, again, acute illness and trauma are different than somebody who is going through a natural disease death progression. So preactive is roughly now. Please bear in mind that, again, just like terminal condition, all of these are kind of ballpark. We don't have a good, dis like, we don't have a good timeline for any of this. This is very individualized. This is very, very roughed. Uh, but generally speaking, with somebody with a hospice, can in hospice or with a, a severe condition, when these symptoms start to develop, people will, will uh, say, ah, we're at, we are in the beginning of the end now. So preactive is roughly one to four weeks. What you'll see in the patient is increased anxiety and restlessness. Um, 
and this is interesting, is they have increased restless anxiety, but they also will begin to sleep more. So what you see is people, uh, people sleeping more, but also you see them fidgety and anxious and pacing and not able to sit still. Uh, at this point, their food and beverage intake begins to decrease. They also see people who have died. And oftentimes, this is, this is a comforting thing. This is seeing loved ones who have passed away earlier. This is kind of that come join us idea. Um, so again, these, these often are not scary to them so much as they're comforting to them. They begin to very, be very, very concerned about unfinished business, things they need to do. And this may be from a long time ago. This may be from like, I need to settle up with, their, with Harry, who this was 15 years ago. You know, Harry may not even be alive at this point. But they want to make sure all of their loose ends are tied up. And I should mention very quickly while I'm doing that, this isn't like a conscious thing. They're not like, ooh, I'm out of time. I need to do this. This is a um, unconscious, almost instinctual feeling that they, they have things they need to do. Active, now, <clears throat> excuse me. Active is when it is advancing. So preactive is uh, kind of things begin to slowly shut down. Uh, if you think of the body as, as a complex kind of machine, this is it beginning to shut systems down. Active is when we are in the last stage. Active typically takes about 24 to 72 hours. That's, that's not a given by any means, but that's roughly where, th th that's roughly the timeline. Uh, the patient will have vivid detailed hallucinations. They also... The, these hallucinations are so detailed, they have a difficult time um, separating the hallucination from reality. And this isn't like an acute thing that happens in the moment necessarily. It may be an ongoing issue. I have been been to visit people who are in active, the active phase of dying, who are convinced that I should like greet the person who's sitting in the chair over there. Obviously, they're still there, but they're seeing, again, they're seeing family, they're seeing friends, they're seeing people who have passed away. Um, you may have active refusal of food or drink, and this is like, instead of a diminished intake like we were having, this is none. Um, the patient may start to develop cyanosis, which you got up there. Uh, you know, it's blue. You may have like people turning blue. If you've never seen that, th that's what this is. We're not talking like Smurf blue. It's you know, kind of purpley. Um, you also will see hypotension a lot. Again, as the body's systems begin to slow down and stop, there's no, the heart's not working to maintain blood pressure any longer. The heart's in the veins. They're slowing down uh, and ceasing function, obviously, when they cease function. But you do begin to see these things. Kind of some more acute ones, uh, some worsening of chronic conditions, which that sucks. Um, increased pain and inflammation from uh, whether it's something like uh, you know, arthritis, uh, IB, you know, irritable bowel, or something like that. Symptoms begin to get worse. They begin to inflame more. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This also you have some skin breakdown. What I have here, and I'm not doing pictures of them because they're really. Eh, and you've had enough of that already, are what's called Kennedy ulcers. Kennedy ulcers always form on this area, on the backside. They are indicative of typically less than 24 hours until somebody dies. And they open extremely quickly. This is due to the loss of muscle tone and control, which we're getting into in a second here, and the loss of skin turgor. Partially due to not eating or drinking, partially just due to musculature no longer maintaining function. Um, again, these are a almost dead giveaway that this is coming up. Uh, also, again, you have a loss of muscle tone and control. If they had maintained, if they were had, were continent before, they often lose that ability at this point. Um, they start, they develop what's called Cheney Stokes or Shane Stokes. I've heard both of those, and I don't, even looking it up didn't help. 
uh, Shane Stokes breathing, I think that's correct. That is, if you have ever been around somebody who is dying, that is really rapid, um, bre really rapid shallow breathing, and then a long exhale, and then a long pause. You kind of <laughs> and then some amount of time they'll start again. Um, I, this is again the same thing. Regulatory functions are starting to beginning to slow down and stop at this point. Um, also, uh, I didn't include it in here because it's not really a good term for art. term I like. Something just called a death rattle, which is a kind of a gurgling, rattling sound as people breathe. And same thing as the Shane Stokes breathing. It is a, it's, it's related to maintenance functions in the body beginning to stop. Uh, you'll see the ears opening a lot, which is... I can't show you. I didn't have a good picture of this. This is the muscles back here that hold the ears down. You know, if you have somebody or you are somebody that can wiggle your ears, it's these muscles. I can't do it. Opening is that they kind of collapse outward because there's nothing holding them back in place any longer. Let me scoot up here. They kind of push forward a little bit. Again, it's hard to... I don't have a good way to show that. It's just something you'll note. Um, also, some of this, like... So, Face turgor, face control, will begin to relax. If you've ever seen someone with a stroke, it's similar to that. It's just, just again, collapse of muscle control and tone. So the face becomes very flat and flaccid. Uh, also, people, if they are conscious and aware, people saying goodbye. Uh, that is a typical sign of very imminent, um, very imminent death. I, I have... To, similar to that doctor doing the TED Talk in, in this uh, module, I have had people that have said to me goodbye, say like the night, uh, in the evening, and I say, yeah, I'll see you in the morning, and they're like, no, no, goodbye. A and they're gone in the morning. Uh, so I I'm not here to get metaphysical or anything on you, but that has happened. The ability to tell is really interesting. I don't know, I don't know how they... I don't know if this is just a lucky guess on their part, and it's just, you know, bias on my part that I'm remembering that, but it has happened. So, if someone tells you goodbye, note that that's probably a very acute symptom. Here's an intimidating wall of text for you. One of those ones I hate, but I don't know how else to fit in. Okay, <laughs> we're going to make a quick turn here, very rapid 90 degree, and talk about food's cultural significance, because this is where you come in. Um, food has, I said, cultural significance in many cultures, and that's that classic academic, not, you know, kind of hedge in your statements, because you don't want to, I can't think of a culture that doesn't have food as an important, as an important cultural significant marker. And just think about ours, right? Um, what do you do when you meet a friend, uh, especially when it's been away for a while? You probably go have uh, a meal. What do we do to celebrate someone's birthday or a wedding or to acknowledge a funeral? I don't want to say celebrating a funeral. Uh, we have a meal. I would willing to bet you that you, the first thing you, sorry, it was pound of the table there. The first thing you did with this, your significant other is you probably did a thing and a meal, right? Um, it's that, that's the, the significance of food. It also represents health and healing. If you're sick, I'm sure all of us have something that they eat when they don't feel well. You know, whether this is emotionally not feeling well and you have your comfort foods, whether this is um, something when you physically don't feel well, what you eat, we all have something like that that we tie into it. For me, if I am feeling down, it's uh, pork neck bones and rice, which sounds icky, I imagine, but don't knock it until you try it. Uh, and if I don't physically don't feel well, if I'm feeling sick or something, uh, saltines and ginger ale. It ref so you know it represents food, represents health and healing. It represents cultural milestones. It represents caring and family. Watching somebody die again is a very uncomfortable thing. That feeling of helplessness and loss of control, and watching somebody slip away that that the family cares about. And doing nothing, be able to do nothing about it, is a very traumatic experience. 
and food is often used to um, to uh, exemplify caring and to kind of maybe help. It's what they can do to help. That they want to do something. Now, nutritionally, science-wise, right? Uh, obviously, the protein and energy needs of a patient that is an end-of-life decrease. Um, you could, I guess, argue effectively that there's zero at this point. Uh, the metabolism is slowing down. There is no replacement and repair occurring. And 80% of patients in end-of-life report anorexia. So we can anticipate a decrease of intake and a decrease of, of needs. Many people in end of life experience cachexia. Now remember, cachexia is weight loss that's due to an underlying condition. And this is cachexia that's not going to resolve because the underlying condition is that this person is dying and there's no resolving that. So it is cachexia. It is something to, that you need to be aware of and note. And again, as we said in the hospice section, do offer things if they are able to talk, but you're not going to resolve this problem once it, if it develops. Uh, so nutrition support. Again, nutrition and food and eating is considered to be um, healing. It's, it's an example of caring for somebody. So one of the things that families will often ask is, can we start a... Um, can we start some nutrition? Like, can we, can, let me say, can we put a tube in them? Um, remember that because systems are slowing down and stopping, there is no, or very little digestion, there is no, little to no absorption going on. So uh, nutrition support can actually cause physical discomfort in people that are at end of life. There are uh, no changes in mortality or outcomes versus in uh, enteral versus uh, hand feeding. So while it can be difficult and uncomfortable for family to watch somebody spoon feeding mom, it's important to note that for them, keep in mind for you to tell them uh, and also for yourself that there is no change. Doing enteral nutrition is no better than hand feeding and actually that's true for tube feeding or for excuse me excuse, for parenteral as well so nutrition support does not do better than hand hand fed patients there is some evidence that physical signs and symptoms improve but this is a very acute improvement and you have to weigh those improvements against what the outcome is going to be and what the patient wants uh, hydration is a little bit more flexible and we'll, we'll discuss this more in a minute uh, the Academy says, uh, and both actually the Academy and Aspen say, that reversing malnutrition is likely impossible at this point. And actually, I would argue, why? Um, why be active, why actively try to step in and try to uh, avert malnutrition if we're at end of life? Um, when you're active, when someone is actively dying, MNT is no longer a goal I don't think it is appropriate to try. This is my take. I do. I don't think it's appropriate. Inappropriate. I don't think it is appropriate to try to do an aggressive nutrition intervention for somebody at end of life. Uh, remember, and again, enteral parental nutrition may cause harm. What's typically done is that PO food is offered but not encouraged. And by offered, I don't mean, hey, Miss Abercrombie, would you like something to eat? I mean you bring in some food. You leave it there. If they need help, somebody provides help to see if they want to eat. If they don't, you don't make it. You don't push the case. Uh, again, enteral parental nutrition is generally not considered appropriate. The uh, American Gerontological Society, Aspen, and the Academy actually say that at end of life, um, it's not appropriate to do a nutrition to do a nutrition supplementation. It's interesting that they make that statement and then also say, yeah, it's probably going to be difficult to stop malnutrition at this point. Uh, those are their statements, so not mine. Uh, hydration, though, is a little different because hydration can be, you know, people are 
typically end of life hungry any longer. They, um, but hydration is a little bit different. That is uncomfortable. It can be at least. So hydration is more of a case by case basis. What you need to consider for both hydration and maybe enteral even earlier is where the person is. If they are, um, if they're bed fast, they're not getting up and moving, maybe hydration via IV would be appropriate. Maybe a bit beneficial. It kind of depends. Um, you can just offer, a, not you, but you can recommend that uh, you do oral care and do some glycerin wipes in their mouth and stuff instead if you're concerned about like dry mouth and cracked lips and things like that. But if the person is um, still able to get up and move around, hydration by IV may not be appropriate. You know, what if, if they are confused and agitated and moving around, it's very likely they're going to pull that out. So this is a case-by-case -case basis. I cannot give you any kind of hard data points for this. It's very much what the care team as a whole decides. So uh, a little bit more into this. What is your role here? There are no clear needs on estimations for terminal patients. And again, I would argue personally, uh, why? You know, why, would you, why would you expect them? I guess I would say. What are you hoping to do at this point? So nutrition support is maintained if the patient desires it. You may have people that want to eat. And if they do, great. And again, if they do, don't get in the way. Uh, if it's completely outside the realm of what they should be eating, who cares? You know, even if it's like a different consistency, who cares? Let them have what they want. Uh, food is, again, usually offered per patient request, or it'll say pleasure feedings only or something like that. Again, they're not encouraged to eat. They're only offered food. And by offered, I don't even mean a question like, would you like something? Because that kind of puts a burden on them to, add, to answer the question, to make a decision. Instead, it's just brought in and left. Okay, so it is important to educate family and staff. And um, what I often remind people of is that this person is not dying because they are not eating. They are not eating because they are dying. It is very, very, again, it's very difficult to just watch somebody kind of stop. And nutrition is one of those things that everybody knows they need. Everybody's aware of that. The, again, the cultural, uh, the cultural norm is when somebody is eating, you tell them you need to eat to get your strength back. They're not going to get their strength back. And it's very hard to hear that. And people will often argue the point and be in denial. So I'm not trying to bum you out here. That's just how that's going to be. Family will try to get patients to eat because of the cultural symbol uh, symbolism of food. It represents family and health. So your job at this point is to step in and say, let's not push them. You can leave it here if you want to. And, you know, they may have something that, from the family that they love. Maybe it's a, their favorite dish. And, and maybe it'll make them feel better, and that's fine. But what we want to step away from is pushing them to eat. You know, try to eat a little bit. Have a few bites for me. Don't. That's inappropriate at this point. Now, obviously, you don't step in there and slap the spoon out of their hand. But educate the, educate the family and staff. Like, eating is no longer a concern. Again, they're not dying because they are not eating. They are not eating because they are dying. And that is the takeaway that you need to help family process. One more wall of text for you here. Okay, that is end of life. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a tough topic for a lot of people. It's important in geriatric care. When we come back to unit four, we are going to do a whole different thing, and we're going to discuss a little bit on regulations and facilities, and we're finally going to get into geriatric-specific interventions, what you can do to help people. I, you know, I want to end on a positive note. So I will catch you all in the next one. Have a good one. Bye.